Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and today we're going to have a look at a K62 that actually works uh, mostly because we're not using that same TMC motherboard we're using some of the same hardware though, we've got the same CPU and the motherboard we are using is, we might be sort of familiar with it it's, it's one I've got just to build this machine but we've, we might be familiar with it but we'll, we'll get on to that as the video goes on I guess now, uh, you might notice, I forgot to mention last time I did a video, I have a new tripod now, so the camera's actually properly stable and it's a lot higher, so now we can look at each other at eye level, or, well, I can't see you through the camera yet. I sort of, well maybe I can, I'm just not telling you. So yeah, now we can look at each other on, a, on an equal footing here, which is good, because now it doesn't look like some sort of grainy BDSM video, which... It could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective on such things, I suppose. On the other hand, we should be in uh, 1080p now. Unfortunately, we have to upsample the camera. Uh, yeah, Sony's marketing lies. I, I want to get a new one towards the end of the year. I've had this one a while. It was the only one I could get. I've never really liked it, so we'll do something about it later on. And this video is going to have a slightly faster pace than usual, because I'd like to get more than one done this month to make up for it being a bit dry last month. Mostly because Mullet Man just came in here and he started messing about with things and they hijacked my channel. So, yeah, uh, that was a bit of an inconvenience. And I had a whole bunch of other stuff that got in the way, but that's dealt with now. This is my catch up video. We can go back to the regular pace next time. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess we'll get on with having a look at this blooming thing, see what it's doing, you know, if, it's, if it holds up that well. Right, let's get on to this thing. So, the chassis is a bit tacky. It's yellow, then it was probably quite cheap when it was new. But then if you were buying a K6, you likely didn't have the funds for anything fancy, so it is accurate. Fancy things were for Pentium owners. Yeah, I think I've said before that the K6 was intended really more of as a Celeron competitor than a Pentium 2 or Pentium 3. It's, it wasn't the high end, but it was bang for your buck. Two CD drives are installed, supposedly we can burn discs with them too, DVDs even, but I've not really tried that. They were just in the chassis when I was building the machine, and they seem to work, so, well, I don't see a need to change them out. There's also a floppy drive. Uh, this is intermittent at best, but it's not really been needed enough to be changed as yet. Can be fixed at a moment's notice, so, yeah, I'll replace it with a working one or repair it if need be. At the back of the chassis it becomes clear that this is an ATX case with an AT backplane shield. This wasn't actually so uncommon at the time as AT cases were going out of production. It was often more cost effective to make just one case in the ATX form factor which took advantage of mounting holes sharing the same spot and then just offer a shield to adapt it. You could even sell this backplane IO shield separately if you wanted to be a dick about it and I'm Pretty certain some manufacturers did. Below this is an obligatory serial port, but also a PS2 port, which I stole from the bad TMC board that we used before, very briefly. And when I say used, that's, uh, that's been generous to it. Then we have a video card, a network card, and an audio card that we'll look at properly once the case is open, but first we'll have a look at the power supply very quickly. This was my first ever ATX power supply, and somehow it's still working. It's not very powerful, but then this system's not going to suck that much current anywhere. Yeah, it's an ATX power supply. A lot of these late model AT boards could use either type, if only because you might mount one in a case like this, where the more traditional buttons couldn't be mounted and anywhere. A cheap PSU was often included with the chassis back then, and it was usually ATX, because much like the cases, the AT ones were, well, well, they weren't quite the mainstream anymore. They were still there, but they weren't the main source of sales. They weren't made as higher volumes, and you know, you might as well just make it ATX compatible now because that's the way everything's gone. Be warned, the motherboard does need a jumper set depending on which type of power supply you've got plugged into it, and quite a few of them with both connector types do have such a jumper, so be sure to check that it's set correctly if you're working on a board like this. 
This motherboard is a Chaintec 5 AGM2, which might sound familiar. Going back quite a long time now, we have seen a board of this model on my channel before. In fact, you've probably seen it more than you knew. Notably, it was running Atlantis in the review of that game, but it wasn't this same board, despite being the same model. You probably know my K6 was stolen when I moved house, and it's taken almost two years to track down the same model of motherboard again. There is actually a difference on this one, but it's small and you it's not visual, you wouldn't be able to see it. In days gone by, these serial port headers had two different pinouts, Intel and Everex, I think they were known as. Intel used their own pinout, go figure, whereas almost everyone else used the Everex one. Well, this board also uses the, the more common Everex pinout, but my original one, of this same model, used the Intel pinout. I do think I might have a, an explanation as to why. As far as I could tell, the old board came out of a Gateway branded machine, and all the Gateways used Intel motherboards pretty much religiously. Likely they ordered enough boards from Chaintech to convince them to alter the pinout so that Gateway could use the same chassis and headers that they already had in their inventory instead of having to manufacture or order more than one type. Which makes sense, that's my theory anyway. I've no evidence to back this up. Strangely, however, Chaintech list every pinout in their manual, and I mean everything, except the serial header. It may just be a coincidence, but hey, maybe not. Maybe they omitted it because it would be wrong on some portion of the boards. I don't really know. Not without having access to more of them. If you have one and you happen to know which pinout it uses, then, well, I'd be curious to know how like prevalent each type was but yeah I haven't really seen many of these boards out there well what about that PS2 port yeah those pinouts Chaintech give include the crappy little half pitch header down there which provides USB PS2 and infrared Knowing this pinout made it possible to cut up a laptop to IDE adapter, make sure it's pin 1 to pin 1 and it doesn't bridge any of them if you're going to do this, and then stuff it on there. It gives us regular pitch pins that the PS2 port could use. Um, USB unfortunately crashes windows before I can even install a driver. I need to track down what's doing that. It's definitely a software problem and I suspect that a driver has been neglected to be installed when setting up the, the chipset drivers on here. I, yeah, I've probably forgotten to tick a box or something. It's nothing major, I don't think there's anything physically wrong with the board, or electronically wrong with it, I guess would be the right word to say. Now, if you're wondering why the header is so small and unusual, Chaintech would have sold you a little card that had all of the connectors on it. I've only ever seen one in a photo years and years ago, and it was so grainy that it probably came from a scan of a manual or Chaintech's old website. It seems nobody bought those, but then, like I said, I've not seen many of these boards around either. I think this is only the third or fourth one I've known to exist. 128 megabytes of SD RAM is installed, and well, that's it. It's SD RAM. You can run it at 133 megahertz in this board, as far as I can tell, by syncing it to the AGP bus instead of the CPU front side bus. There should be no need for more RAM in this system anyway. 128 megs is enough, but hey, we, we could push it a little bit farther. We can have at least 256 meg in there if we need to, so there's room to upgrade if required, but I'm in no rush, and plus fact I don't have any more sticks at work left. Uh, or if I do, I, I probably do, but I'd have to find them. They're in some bag somewhere, and I'm not sure where it is right now, and they're untested. Now, you'll notice that this board doesn't have the 72 pin slots like the TMC did. Presumably because uh, TMC just slapped the 100 MHz MVP3 chipset on their existing 66 MHz VP3 based AI5 VG board design, Chaintech threw the old 66 MHz VP3 based 5A GM2 board in the trash and designed the 100 MHz MVP3 based 5A GM2 from the ground up to work out the highest speeds. That was a real mouthful, but basically uh, TMC just overclocked a 66 MHz board to 100 MHz, Chaintech designed a board to run at 100 MHz. Now, if you do remember the TMC, you'll remember me complaining about the power circuitry on it, and yeah, 
is pretty clear really this chain tech has done it a lot better that's a much more modern looking implementation it's nice and clean it's soldered to the board properly instead of looking like it was done by a small Asian child for a bowl of rice in the afternoon on a good day which sucks to be them but I guess chain tech's Chinese children that they had in the factories were a bit more competent than TMC's ah reason being that this board was made in Taiwan I guess sorry about that because that's totally not China apparently, or is it? Who knows? Things that have that on tend to be better quality, so I'm just going to say it's not China. I'm pretty certain it's disputed to this very day. Weirdly, it seems Chaintech never officially supported CPUs at over 300 megahertz, though, where TMC did. That's kind of ironic because I'm using the same 500 megahertz K62 in this board as we were in the TMC, and well, it runs a damn sight better. But hey, I guess that's what'll happen when you design a motherboard to run at its rated bus speed instead of just overclocking a slower one. Unfortunately, I've run out of thermal paste again, so I can't actually show you the CPU, but I can show you a, a lower clocked one, which it's basically identical. I mean, they probably came off of the same belt and they just slowed this one down. Usually you don't manufacture slower CPUs, you just underclock ones that don't meet quality control. So, yeah, the only real difference in appearance, other than the number, is that the stamped lettering and numbering is green on the one under that heatsink. It seems to be a fairly late revision, that one. So, yeah, this, this slower one is a little bit older, but again, they're much the same. And if you pull that die cover off, which I'm not going to do, it pretty much just looks like an early ceramic Athlon. It's the same process now enough. I mean, why change the design that, you know, already works? You, if you've got a good fabrication process, it's working. Well, there's not much point in altering it extensively, is there? I suppose that we already know that the AMD K6 is really just the next gen 686 in disguise, modified to work in socket 7. There is no pretense here that this thing isn't going to work, it's going to work, and now I can actually show you, like I wanted to, that despite the next gen 586's shortcomings, its successor was a far more successful successor of a processor. Yeah. Apparently. In the meantime, that video card, it's a 3DFX Voodoo 3 2000. Yeah. It does feature some shoddy repairs, and it does look a bit mingy with that Enforce 2 heatsink stuck on it, but it was burning the flesh on my finger to touch the original heatsink, or at least causing blisters, so rather than let it burn out, I put that there, because people have jacked the prices up, and after all, an ugly card is going to be better than a dead one, sort of like prostitutes, only the other way around. This was the card where 3DFX stopped being complete retards and decided they might as well just try to do something right for a change, like the other card makers had been trying to do for years. It's a shame it took them so long because the design, at least from a physical standpoint, looks quite good, in that it looks like every other bloody video card from its time, so they're on the right track. It actually uses the AGP bus as well, instead of bottlenecking the shared parallel PCI bus all the time. It integrates everything into a few components, largely one big ASIC, and a RAM DAC. Hell, I think some of them even integrated the RAM DAC into the ASIC. Who would have thought? In case you're wondering, the RAM on the card is SD RAM and there's 16 megabytes total. It can't be upgraded, but hey, that feature was gone from most cards by this point. Still, shit, what the hell took you so long, 3DFX? I mean, this was like four, nearly five years since you entered this market, and it took you until now to start actually trying to make something useful instead of just dicking around with weird peripheral boards that don't really work. It, it just sucks that you had to pretty much kill STB to do it, but, well, I'll give you an A for the effort. This was a step in the right direction. Might have been too little too late, though. Mm, I guess we'll have to try it out properly someday. The network card in this system is a 3.905C TXM or something like that. They're common as dirt. We've seen them a million times. We know them by now. Moving on. The sound card is a little less common. It's a Turtle Beach Malibu. And, well, as far as I can tell, this was the cheaper option from Turtle Beach at the time. By which I mean it probably cost only a few months rent instead of a few years. From what I can tell, their stuff was quite pricey. And I don't necessarily know that that's justified from what I've experienced of them. This card, it's not too bad. It uses one of those crystal audio codecs that all the cheap China cards were starting to use at the time. And it has a way 
surf table stuck to it. SP diff is also available but I haven't really tested that yet so I don't know how well that feature works and currently don't have much in the way of a means to do so. We'll worry about that another time. It's not that important with this card. It is a nice feature to have though. A lot of more expensive cards didn't even have that although this has been a total beach it still wouldn't have exactly been cheap so yeah I guess I kind of expect something gimmicky and extra on this. By the way, I don't know what this header does. I've no idea. Can't really even find a manual that explains it, but I'll keep looking. Evidently nothing important as the card works with it completely unpopulated, unconnected, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, no idea. The system runs Windows 98 2nd Edition, which is installed on a 20GB Seagate hard drive. Again, that's nothing eventful usually but it means it's beating the TMC again because that really didn't like booting operating systems actually yeah we're using both IDE channels at the same time one for hard drives and one for CD-ROM drives which the TMC also couldn't do hey that's really good isn't it you know I mean using both IDE channels yeah it shouldn't be a big deal and well this board isn't making a big deal it's just doing what we're asking it to do and what it should do so it's all going well so far now that Turtle Beach card is a bit weird. It will work with the regular Crystal drivers, in fact the ones that come in Windows 98 2nd edition, so it'll work out the box. The card does have its own drivers available as well, and I think there was some gimmicky mixer software or something for it, but if there was, I don't have it right now, and I doubt it does much of anything useful. I don't believe you can load your own samples on this. I'm pretty certain it's a 2 megabyte ROM that it uses. It's a, a 4 megabyte sound set with some proprietary cars wheel compression on it. Now, the Crystal Kodak is fairly compatible with the Sound Blaster Pro for DOS games, and the Wavetable is accessible to them as a general MIDI device. And of course, the Crystal and the Wavetable will work in Windows just like any other card. So, I guess we should have a listen to it. Yeah, it's not actually terrible, but it's not really great either. I mean, I think we sort of got past the point of cheap wavetables what sounded like this a few years before, but it's okay, I guess. Oddly, it sounds pretty much nothing like the recordings I've heard of this card on the internet, and I'm not sure why that is, because it's a Cars Wheel sound set, and it definitely sounds like the Cars Wheel synth on another Turtle Beach card I have from around about the same time period one which we shall see in the future. The recordings online sound nothing like either of these cards, so yeah, really not sure what that's about. Still, the lack of extra drum kits is a bit disappointing. There's no power kit, no rock kit, no analog kit, but it's not as disappointing as some other cards I can think of that, again, we will be seeing in a later video. I suppose the, the Crystal FM isn't too bad, it's probably an in-the-middle kind of implementation, as in it's not real great, but it's not totally shit. You're gonna get, like, the odd song in it that sounds terrible, but 
it's not bad. So you can always fall on that if you have problems with the wave table, but yeah. I don't know, it's a bit disappointing to like Turtle Beach sort of try and pass themselves off as like an upmarket brand and by this time I really don't think they were all that much because their PCI cards don't really look all that great either. I haven't tried one but uh, yeah, probably were because they still cost a lot of money to get hold of and I can't really justify it because I don't think they'd be that useful to me. Uh, if anyone has any experience with those, let me know. I'm kind of curious as to how decent or how not decent they were. But still, it's... yeah, I'd expect a bit more by now. It's a bit lacking in places, but like I say, it's passable at least. It's better than nothing. Well, just a quick couple of notes about this wavetable before I forget. I don't know why I've uh, forgotten to mention these. But it's quite quiet compared to the PCM. Uh, not so much in Windows, more so in DOS. Is it really, really quiet? And this crystal chip, I think, stores separate values for the DOS mixer. Like the DOS mixer and the Windows mixer, but obviously only one set of those values is exposed to Windows. The TerraTech actually does the same thing, but it has facilities to deal with that in the software. If there is software for this card, it might deal with it. But there may also be a... The, the regular crystal mixer for DOS should work. I don't have that, but if you do run into one of these, it's something to bear in mind. I don't know what sort of volume levels you're going to get out of that wavetable in DOS. And I don't know how adjustable it's going to be. But, you know, something to just bear in mind really quick. Hey look, it has a sounds really shitty slider in the mixer in case you want to make everything sound really shitty. At least I'm assuming that's what SRS stands for, because I mean, what was the point in this feature? I'll, I'll never quite understand why they put this on things. It's like, oh, yeah, I really like this record, but it, it sounds a bit too good. I want it to sound crap today. Ah, there we go. Yeah, that's much better. Now, now it sounds like it was recorded on a, like, dictation machine at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, yeah, this sounds fucking shit! Outside of messing with that, I guess we should look at the regular benchmarks, but I'm going to go through them as fast as I can today. As always, we're running them in pure DOS with no drivers loaded. So, 3D Bench scores 383.6, PC Player scores 119.3, Top Bench is 505, Speed Sys scores 573.70 for the CPU. We can pull 241.68 megabytes per second of memory bandwidth, about 66 megabytes bytes per second for the video memory, 2.2 gigabytes per second for the level 1 cache, and 304.24... No, 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 hold on, back that up a second. 2.2 gigabytes for the level 1 cache? Wow, that's actually pretty impressive. We can manage 304.24 for the level 2 cache, which is still external on the K62. It's not on the CPU or on the die, anything like that. It's soldered on the motherboard, and this motherboard has 512 kibabytes soldered onto it over there. This varies from board to board, even sometimes with the same model, so if you're looking for a Super 7 board, well, keep an eye on that feature, because you often can't upgrade them this late on. No curse sticks like the earlier ones. Memory throughput score is about 131.26. Uh, if I'm reading that right. Doom will complete that same old demo at about 601 real takes, which... What's that, about 124 frames a second or something? It's pretty quick. We're faster than the game's going to ever manage when it's running normally anyway, because it's capped at 35 frames a second, I think. It's like half the refresh rate it's capped at when it's running normally. Quirk manages 79.4 frames a second, so interesting, we're not quite at that point where it will run faster than Doom, as becomes the case with some later CPUs. But we may soon see one where the gap has gotten extremely narrow and things are about to change, as in there's less than 10 frames per second difference in it. Might not be too far in the future. Now, it may be interesting to note that tests here trade places with the TMC board from time to time. For example, 3D Bench is faster on the chain tech by a fraction of a point, where PC Player is faster on the TMC by a, that similar fraction of a point. Well within the margins for error, of course. 
Top bench is also slower as the TMC could nab 660 points here and the Chantac tops out at around 505 with its current configuration. It does have different hardware in here that could be affecting it. Nonetheless, their SpeedSys CPU score was pretty much identical, but the TMC was about 20 megabytes per second faster in the level 1 cache and meg faster at level 2, about 10 megs faster in memory bandwidth. And it was, however, 4 ticks slower than the Chantac in Doom and barely a frame faster in Quake. Yeah, so the TMC may actually be the faster of these two boards, although do bear in mind I've got some fairly conservative settings on for now. Not many, but we could probably make this go a little bit faster and catch up with the TMC if we wanted to. I do think though that with identical settings and an identical configuration the TMC would score higher than this board overall. And it's strange how boards from companies that seem about to disappear tend to do that. Think of those last few DFI boards before they started fading out. At least out of the consumer market they're still making industrial boards and well those are still good as far as I know. But yeah, think of that NF2 Ultra I had. It was really, really fast in the benchmarks, but it was really un unstable and unreliable like this TMC was. I'd much rather have a board like this Chaintech because I know it will work and the loss of speed isn't that noticeable anyway. Besides, I can't be bothered to circle jerk over who has the fastest machine outside of jerking about it. What's the point? If it's doing what the user wants it to do, that's what matters. You know, I might not like the hardware you use. I might think my machine's quicker. You might think your machine's quicker and not like the hardware I'm using. But the important thing is, it, it does what you want it to do. Yours, that is, and well, mine does what I want it to do, and that's that's all I could really care less about in the case of this. Unless it's got some gimmick that's particularly novel. I like gimmicky things. Gimmicky things are fun. I currently have no Windows benchmarks to run, but I guess we'll see them in the future. I mean, at the moment, I don't have any metric to compare this machine with, so we might as well wait until we can put that right and compare it with something else. For now, we'll just look at a couple of games running on here, so, well, it goes without saying, it can run most of what my K5 can run, but faster, so there's no point lingering on those. However, we can run Need for Speed 3 really quite well in glide mode, at 800 by 600 though it doesn't seem quite as sharp or vibrant as Direct 3D on other cards. It's okay though, and like I say, 800 by 600 that's actually quite impressive, that's pretty good. It is limited to 16-bit colouring glide though, and well, colour limits on 3DFX hardware are nothing new, because oddly, the drivers for the card do allow 32-bit colour modes. But I happen to know that RamDAC can only provide 24-bit colour depth, rendering those modes useless, and well, possibly they'll look worse. I would imagine they existed solely for compatibility because, well, the other vendors were going over to 32-bit and pretty much already had, so it would have left 3DFX out in the cold again for another generation, and I guess they didn't want that, so it's not as dumb a move as it seems, but it's a little bit hackish. Now, it appears we have a lot of driving games going on, I don't know why, I guess I must be in a mood for playing driving games right now, because Test Drive Off-Road 3 runs smoothly, mostly. Because some tracks, notably the fast one you play, run really badly, and the colours look crappy. I, I almost thought something was wrong and I was about to yell at the Voodoo, and I would like to blame the Voodoo 3, but I'm inclined to think the developers just didn't support it properly, despite offering explicit support for the Voodoo 3. I mean, it's a cheap game and it doesn't seem that well made, so, you know, mm, we can't really use this as the the determining factor, can we? Now what I can bash on the card for is messing up the textures in Direct 3D mode. So you can't just use that to compensate, and I'm sorry but you're really late to the party here 3DFX, you're gonna have to accept your API is dead, it was never going to get anywhere, because guess what, Direct 3D is made by the same people who wrote the damn operating system, or at least the same company, oh geez, I wonder which API was going to become dominant in this fucking war. Oh, man, we'd have never guessed, would we? I mean, it's never going to be Direct 3D. Even then, it does tend to mess up palettes in some other games, but do notice how Need for Speed 3's glide renderer did look and run way better than Test Drive Off-Road 3. 
they're about the same age, they even have really similar textures and stuff, so yeah, I guess this card is capable when it's supported properly, though I'm still not letting it off for how bad it is at Direct3D. Regardless, the important thing is both games run far better than they did on the TMC. In fact, I don't think the TMC could run Need for Speed at all, and it barely ran Test Drive Off-Road 3. I wouldn't really call that running, it was, it was limping Test Drive Off-Road 3, it was bad. On that note, I can't use my wheel. As soon as I press the pedals, the system loses track of it and it won't re-detect it, even if I unplug it for a while. I think the Turtle Beach card can't provide enough power for larger controllers because it won't work with my Sidewinder, for which the system may be too fast, or my P16 joystick either doing similar things, just losing track of them. It will work with smaller joysticks, Oh, it's reliable with these, it works, he says, and then the two-button joystick drops out as well. Um, yeah, obviously there's a problem with the joystick interface on this card. I don't know if it stands for all of the Turtle Beach Malibus or just mine, but yeah, it's not working with two-button joysticks now either. On the upside, at least it means my joystick hasn't stopped working, or any of my joysticks, because it, it just sucks when your joystick stops working, I would think. I don't know, it hasn't happened to me yet. But either way, we know where the problem is. Sound cards have been the bane of my existence rebuilding this machine and another one. So, yeah, it's looking increasingly like we'll be swapping this one out for something else. Because I'm, I'm starting to not like this sound card very much. It's causing me a few problems as time goes on. So, might not be sticking around. Maybe put an R64 in here like the old K6 had. It did fine on one of those, they're not the best card, the wavetable on them's a little bit screwy because nothing really utilises it and, well they should have geared it more towards general MIDI anyway when you think about it, so no one's to blame but themselves. But hey, uh, what are you going to do? We've got solutions that we can implement, so it's no big deal, the machine's still good, it's a minor peripheral with a small problem. Interstate 76 runs pretty good on here, which is weird, because this game never runs really all that good. I mean, it might run fast, but it's notoriously unreliable. Obviously, I prefer the Nitro Pack over the regular game, largely because it's about a million times more stupid when you can constantly break it in some way, like putting cutscenes out of sync or killing things you shouldn't be killing. You wanna go crimson? Crimson. Careful what you wish for. You do. Radiator mother, this is Monkey Wrench. I got the car. Excellent, Monkey Wrench! Oh, I'll make it up to you, lad. Now sit tight and make sure Bob doesn't get away. I got plans for that bastard. I'm hitching a ride. I should be there in a jeep. Radiate the mother out! God, what a terrible game. It has this this factor of bringing you back. You just can't help but coming back to it. And it It is really, I'm sure, a case of like a train wreck where you just can't help but look. You can't help but turn your head like and look behind it once you've sped past it on the highway. It's, it's just one of those things. Now, there is a problem because I can't play Atlantis on here, which is one of the main things I wanted this system for. It's not a big deal because we know the machine should run it, because my old one did, on the same board. The culprit here is the 3DFX card for whatever reason, so I guess I'm going to have to put something else in here because the compatibility problems with this thing are just mounding up as I suspected they would, which is a shame because otherwise 3DFX actually might have done a good job on this one. I, as I say, I guess we'll have to probe it a little bit further as well as the, some of the other models someday. I mean, we've got this K6 now, there's no reason we can't. Still, fair enough, I never plan to keep this card in this machine, and really there's nothing special about it, it's not that fast, and whilst the signal quality is good, it does let that down by the fact most glide renderers aren't that well written it seems, and they look blurry with crushed colours, and obviously the card doesn't really do Direct 3D or OpenGL, so... I guess I'll have to move to an NVIDIA or ATI card, which does what I want it to do later. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. I, I've got cards that could end up in here. I had a Radeon VE in my old Radeon VE, and that was doing quite well. So maybe I'll go back to that, or maybe I'll go to a, a TNT2 or something. I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. 
Still, that is basically it. We have a working K6, which should be good for anything my K5 isn't fast enough for, and it should save me wasting power trying to play all the stuff on the Athlon. I assure you, you don't really want to be playing Interstate 76 on an AMD Athlon. You're going to have some reliability problems with the game there, unless you're prepared to mess with it. Yeah, I'm not really sure why I neglected to mention this in the script, but Little Big Adventure 2 obviously plays a lot better on this than it does on the K5. I don't know what it is with French games from the time that came out, or whether it was old games and it just so happens a lot of the ones I like from about 97 came out of France, don't ask me, but yeah, they really understate the system requirements on the box. The only issue is that the game is having the palette problems that other things have had with this Voodoo 3, so we're definitely going to have to change that card out, which I've probably said a few times by now. But we know the machine's going to run it good. We know that we don't have to put up with it varging on uncomfortable at times on the K5 anymore, and now we can bray pregnant women and children and pretty much everything else in sight at high frame rates without the load time between each perspective change and everything. So, well, we can play it better, so we might as well. So that's good, this machine is shaping up pretty good so far because I've just wanted to sit down and play this thing properly for a long time now and I've not been able to. Now, it's not quite the same as my old machine. It's probably not quite as good in some way, especially the video card because I had a dual GPU one in, in the old machine. But, well, I guess it's good enough so we can put all the yelling about not having a K6 to bed at last. I'll probably grow to like this system as much as my original one with time. Uh, at least I hope so. Uh, and if not, well, we might like it nearly as much, which is a, as best we can do, I suppose. Well, I suppose I'd better pass you back to the, the guy on the camera, because I'm sure he's got something he wants to, like, prattle on about for the next 200 years. And so that's that. That's this new K6 II. I'm actually quite pleased with it. Of course, we are going to have to replace that video card, but that's a very trivial thing to do. I'll have to reinstall Windows, I would think, because uninstalling 3DFX drivers usually is bricks the operating system, or you can get it to work, but every time you try and start another application, it starts looking for Glide DLLs for some reason. And I can't be bothered. There's nothing important on the machine. We'll just reinstall Windows from scratch, and we'll put a different video card in. It's a shame, because I really wanted to like the Voodoo 3, and we will have to look at these Voodoo cards properly someday, because well, we've got this machine now, so we can plug them all into this. So it's a, a level playing field. We just take an image of the hard drive before it's installed, and then you know just write that image back on the drive before we test each one. And then we can see how they hold up, and maybe put them against their contemporaries of the time. I'm sure it's been done before, but as I've said years ago, I'd like another look. Maybe I was wrong about them, but uh, it's not looking that way so far, is it? It's, it's looking like they've they've taken a step the right way with the Voodoo 3, but, I mean, it's taken them four or five years to do it. I think they're a bit late to the party, unfortunately, because by now NVIDIA and ATI were gaining some pretty serious ground and making some major leaps. I mean, we had, like, the GeForce 256 was around, things like that, and, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know, man, I, I don't, I don't really think this thing holds up, because there's just so much stuff that it doesn't run right. But that's a small problem. Because we're using the same motherboard as the old K6, the one I had before I moved house, and, you know, because it, it's worked the same way as that did otherwise, as in it's worked really, really well and hasn't really broken anything at all, it's pretty safe to say that it will do all the stuff that I want it to do, and it will do it as well as it needs to do, if not better. So I'm, I'm not worried at all about the compatibility issues that card's introducing. Those should go away, and we should be able to run Atlantis. We should be able to run pretty much everything I want to do on that. And, of course, you know, it's... The good thing, as we said, is you can fiddle with the speed of the K6 a hell of a lot. So if I don't have access to another machine for some reason, or I just can't be bothered, then, well, you can always run it on this. You know, that's, that's like I said, the good thing with the K6, especially if you're, if you're limited space or you don't want to earn more than one old computer, but you still want one, well, they're a good thing to have. They're really nifty. There's, you can do a hell of a lot with them. And the motherboards let you plug in all sorts of different processes if you really need something special in there, you know, we can we can plug a Pentium 75 in there, like a proper 
you know, socket 5, gold top, Pentium 75, it will work. It'll be absolutely fine. So, you know, they're, they're a really broad platform, Super Socket 7, very useful. Now, obviously, I've not compared it too much in benchmarks or anything today, because we don't really have a metric to go against. We could compare it to the K5, but that wouldn't be far, really. We could compare it to uh, the Athlon, but again, that wouldn't be particularly far. My Pentium 3, I still need to replace the hard drives. It's taken me a long time, because SCSI hard drives cost a lot of money. They're really expensive. <laughs> And it's, it's really off-putting. I'm honestly thinking I might just fork out and use SCSI to SD or something. It might be worth it, because then I know they're going to last. Because the thing with SCSI hard drives, they have a lot of miles on them usually. They've come out with servers, and so they might not last much longer. You know, it's, it's a bit of a gamble. You might as well pay a bit more, but no, it's going to work for years. So I'm sort of buying that up right now. But again, that Pentium 3 is like a dual 1.1 GHz machine. It's got a Quadro 2 Pro in it. It's not really a far comparison. So maybe somewhere in the non too distant future we, we may have a far comparison for it. And I'm sure that if you follow me around the rest of the internet, and I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned it here in passing, but certainly if you follow me about my boards or my Discord, you're going to know exactly what machine I want to compare this with. And even then, might have to compare that same machine to itself someday. And that's probably what we're going to see next, but I'm not sure. Because I'd still like to make a, a short video on, you know, the process of putting that Mullet Man stuff together. It wouldn't be a long video, it'll be just a, a brief, you know, rundown of what went into making that, and limitations of the hardware, and things like that. Just I, I shot sort of bits and pieces while I was working on it, sort of just stick it together. It could be mildly interesting. I don't know when that'll be done. But, yeah, I think that's everything I had to say. So, until next time, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw up. Load DOS 622. Jesus Christ, I just went over there to smoke and there's this colossal back look at that, that is on that is on its fucking side. I'm fucking so I definitely well there's no way it could have done that. There's no way it could have because How would it have done that? I mean It's not like I could <laughs> scared the shit out of me because it went with a colossal bang. Like there was this whoosh and then this bang. Because I mean that's how I had it. Like about there. Because the last thing I filmed wasn't that made in Taiwan down there. And I just put the camera down, turned it off, walked up. I just sat down halfway through rolling a cigarette. And I just hear this like... <laughs> you can even see, look, there's scratch marks on my fucking floor. How in the fuck? It's almost like somebody's dragged it like up like that. Like as if somebody's picked it up and it's knocked it off. Balance. But I don't know how the fuck that could happen because, like I say, it's not like I could have left it precarious. It won't, it's flat bottomed, it won't just go over. You can't balance it, can you? No. It'll fucking, it'll tilt if I do that. It, the centre of gravity on it's not, it's quite high, it'll just go straight over. It's fucking bent now, look at that shit. Crap. Got fucking ghosts or something? God damn it. That was weird. Shimmer wasn't rolling at the time.